Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Next week, we are opening the doors for in-person gatherings. And as you heard, you can sign up online as the attendance is capped for each gathering. So next week, I will either see you here on the live stream, online, or in person. And I'm so excited. I have to admit, I am so excited. I know many people are as well. And again, we'll do everything to ensure everybody's safety who decide to show up. So, here we are. Let's get back into our series, Failing Faith. Now, most of us in community have uh, heard and even said all sorts of things. Um, Cliches, catchphrases, uh, scripture verses and the like. When we try to encourage people, especially if they're going through difficult times. You know of which I speak, right? We, we, We need to say something. And maybe you have been on the receiving end of those um, phrases when something devastating has happened into your life. I believe that many well-meaning people actually resort to repeating certain phrases as if those phrases will provide some sort of relief when a person is going through some sort of grief. Phrases that we often hear are things like, you know, everything happens for a reason, or God's not going to give you more than what you can handle, or, you know, God's got a plan for your life, and the list goes on, because there's a whole bunch of them. Now, some of these phrases and other spiritual sayings uh, can be great sources of comfort to people during difficult times, but that's not always the case. I believe they're often said, really, not to offer comfort, but actually to provide some sort of explanation when there's really no explanation, if you get my drift. You see, because as human beings, there are two things that we really, well, we particularly, we don't like. We don't like science, and we don't like mystery. And we really can't stand a mysterious silence, if you get what I'm saying. So when we're faced with a situation that has no logical explanation, we quell the mystery and we shatter the silence by saying something that we think will be helpful at the moment, probably because we heard somebody else say it at one point in time. And when we simply don't know how to respond, we lean on what I call Christian truisms. Now, I believe that when we use this truism or a cliche, whatever you want to call it, we're we're actually hoping to accomplish two things. First, it provides an answer to a mystery that has confronted us. No matter how misguided or theologically inadequate that answer may be, it's still an answer. And secondly, it it provides us a way out of the conversation. When somebody tells us that uh, they've been just diagnosed with cancer, it's a bit of a conversation stopper, is it not? And so we respond as, or we respond actually with what we have learned. Maybe it's a saying that we think conveys care and concern and some sort of vague sense of spirituality. And, you know, something as simple as, like, don't worry, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. So we say something, we give a person a hug, and then we leave. The problem is we might have actually done more harm than good. Now, we think in the moment that possibly these sayings that are coming out of our mouth are making the person feel better, but in many cases they don't. Instead, they actually make us feel better because we've done something in a situation where there's really nothing that we can do. We don't like to feel helpless and we don't like to feel out of control. And so instead of sitting there with the person in their pain or in their despair, which is actually a very hard and awkward thing to do, but it might be exactly what the person needs. And instead of being there, being in that moment, we speak into this mysterious silence Words that we think convey hope, and then we walk away. Now, a number of years ago, I read a book called Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel by Kate Bowler. Kate is a Winnipeg-born associate professor of the history of Christianity of North America at Duke Divinity School. And I really enjoyed her writing because I was a history buff, but I also liked the way that she approached this subject. And so when her next book arrived on my desk way back in 2019, I couldn't wait to get into it because she then entitled her new work, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. 
Now, if that doesn't draw your curiosity, I don't know what will, because you see what happens is that Kate went from a normal life with a great family and a great job to being diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer almost overnight. And how she dealt with this blow and what she learned about faith and suffering people is the subject of the book. I'd encourage you to read it. You may cry, cry or even laugh out loud. But you'll also understand faith better and how to deal with personal hurt and other hurting people maybe that are in your life. And so what we have in this book is Kate's just matter-of-fact look at her cancer journey, which reminds us to be present with others in their suffering without trying to fix it, without trying to dig for its rationale or to discover the lessons that God is maybe trying to teach a person. And so she goes on and she actually dispels the lie that everything happens for a reason. And she dispels the lie that the, you know, we're entitled to know why why things happen. And she comments on how physical healing is a gift of God in the here and the now, but it's not a divine right. And it remains a mystery to those suffering as to why, you know, some don't receive healing even though they are appealing to God for it. Kate also reminds us that we're not on trial before God, that sickness is not necessarily the result of one's sin or unfaithfulness to God, and that a suffering believer is not a puzzle to be solved. Because when you think about it, as people, we are addicted to self-rule, right? And when you think about it, we, we want God to move now in our way. We don't want it tomorrow, we don't want it the next day, but we want it right now. Why? Because we've anchored our lives and our well laid out plans and we find ourselves believing the lie that we are the center that has to hold everything together. And we've not really yet realized that we're not the anchor that holds all of life together. And our little plans are like little crumbs that fall off the table all, all over the ground. Those are, the, those are our plans that get scattered on the ground. And when this realization happens, then we are found begging and pleading and trying to bargain with God, which are really all part of the human journey at different times in our lives. We're not the anchor. We don't have it all together. Our plans fall off. Then what? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that life was more than what you could bear? Maybe you felt that your divine right as a Christ follower was to be healed or to be set free or to be delivered from your pain and your agony. You ever found yourself saying, you know, I believe, therefore, God, you should. I believe you should. If you have your Bibles, you turn to Romans 8. Verses 18 to 28. Let's read what Paul writes. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently for it. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
There's a story about a pastor one day making a hospital visit. No, it's not me. It's just a story. It's a sermon illustration, but it's very appropriate what I want to share today. Gets to the patient's room, and he finds the patient asleep. I've been there numerous times myself, and so what a good pastor usually does is you write a note to the patient, and you did that. So he did. He he sat down, and he wrote a note, and he put his keys down, and uh, uh, wrote his note, and put the note on the the, uh, the the food tray, and he walked out. And he got to his car. By the time he got to his car, he realized that he forgot his keys, and he had to go back to the hospital room. And so he goes back to the hospital room there. The patient is awake, surprised to see the pastor, happy to see the note. And sure enough, the pastor stays. They have a wonderful visit together. And now it was time for the pastor to leave, and he made sure he picked up his keys and put them in his pocket as not to forget them that second time. To which the patient responded, well, everything happens for a reason. When something incidental happens like that, we often look for a deeper meaning. Maybe you're running late for a meeting and a parking spot opens right next to the door of the building that you're going into. A favor, right? I don't know, maybe you've heard people say that, right? You get caught by a red light and you're kind of discouraged only to w witness a little bit later that there's an accident up ahead that you might have been involved in. Favor, right? You didn't quite finish your homework on the weekend, and then you wake up Monday morning to an email that says, your prof is sick. Oh, favor, right? Everything happens for a reason. Or does it? You know, last week I shared my story regarding a young adult who was one of the bright lights of our youth group, and she goes overseas and tragically gets swept away in a flash flood at the base of a waterfall. When I talk to her father, do you think I should have said to him, well, everything happens for a reason. Well, of course not. As a matter of fact, let me ask you, do you think these things happen for a reason? A terminal disease, death of a child or a loved one, a head-on collision, a loss of a job, a miscarriage, a birth defect. You know, can we agree that some things happen for a reason? Other things happen for no reason. And sure, you know, we could have a meteorological explanation for a flash flood or a medical explanation for a cancerous tumor, but there's no reason for them. There, there's nothing we can say that will explain the why behind such tra tragic events. But sometimes when we're faced with the magnitude of our own or somebody else's grief, right? The enormity of bad news. And we just don't have anything to say, so we rely on or we say everything happens for a reason in the hopes that that's going to provide some sort of comfort. But in essence, what we're really saying is that this is a terrible thing that happened is really a part of God's plan for you. Maybe you can't see the plan, but God wanted this to happen for a reason that you'll understand later. It's actually intended to express words of comfort. It was meant to be. You know, according to this line of reasoning, you know, God has a detailed plan for your life that he, and He wants whatever it is to happen, and it's going to happen because that's his plan for you no matter what. And he brings bad things into your life then for a reason. There's some divine purpose in everything then that happens to you. But here's the thing. This phrase and other catchphrases that we use are really not in the Bible. And here's another thing. They're, they're not even spiritual. They're more mystical and pointing towards something greater than our understanding. But if you think about it, the statement doesn't really say anything. It doesn't say why did it happen, who made it happen, what's the reason behind it. It's this quasi-spiritual version of saying, oh well, or it just must be God's will. And the implication of the statement is that God is behind every event and God has a reason 
for this event happening. And that makes perfect sense when the outcome of this situation is good, like finding a parking spot. But when the statement is applied to a tragic situation, it paints God into a logically indefensible corner. And if everything happens for a reason and God is somehow behind that reason, then God has a whole lot of explanations to give to all of us who have experienced tragedy and loss. Our actions create consequences and our own choices produce results. Yet when we say things like everything happens for a reason, we're usually not talking about cause and effect. Instead, what we're doing is we're actually pointing our finger at God as if to say He is the cause of our problem, and yet because He's God, you know who am I to argue? You know, when somebody dies unexpectedly, we may not say, well, everything happens for a reason, but we do say things that sound familiar, or, sorry, similar. Maybe for you familiar, but similar. It must have been their time. It was part of his plan. It was God's will. Or my personal favorite, God wanted another angel with him. And I think what happens is what we fail to take into account is that when we speak such comforting words, we're actually probably doing more harm than good. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, it's not that you know, we say these things because we're being mean or we're being spiteful. It's because we're uncomfortable and we fully don't understand how God is at work in these matters in which we find ourselves. We don't have the answers. And if anything, these phrases amongst others cloud the confusion we already have about God's, how God's grace even works. And we're just trying to find words. And the first problem we create is the elimination of personal responsibility. Think about it this way. If everything happens according to God's immutable plan, then whatever I do must have been God's will. And God isn't going to change it. Therefore, my choices don't matter. And in fact, the choices of others don't matter because God is controlling everything that happens, not only to me, but to them. Thus, I can't be held responsible for my actions. I was only doing what God willed me to do. I think about a father who was killed in a head-on collision on Dougal Road. I think it was about 2015, 2016. A number of years back. And, and, and the headline said that the driver of the other vehicle was not only over the limit, but texting as well. So if everything happens for a reason, then God caused this young driver to drink to excess and to be texting while driving, which resulted in killing another human being. And so therefore, then maybe there should be no responsibility on the young man, but I doubt if that will hold up in court. And just like a few weeks ago, talking with Pastor Paul about a young mom who overdosed and died in the North End. If everything happens for a reason, then did God make her take more drugs than necessary that night that took her life? No responsibility on her? God did it? That's kind of harsh, is it not? And I think the second problem we face is that these half-truths makes God responsible for everyone's actions. I was going to show the clip, but I think we would have problems with Facebook and I didn't want to do it, but there's that clip in Bruce Almighty. Great Jim Carrey movie. Where he is at his end and, and he says this, God is just a mean kid with a magnifying glass and I'm an ant. He could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to, but he'd rather burn off my feelers and watch me squirm. See, if God actually intended for everything to happen 
then God is actually responsible for every terrible thing that happens in this world. And if we carry that out to its logical conclusion, then everything that happens, either good or bad, happens for a divinely ordained reason. Be it an earthquake, tornado, accident, floods, and of course the list goes on. Here's the third problem. The third problem with this is that these kind of statements lead to a fatalism and indifference. Indifference is basically where it would just cause the rest of us to throw our hands up in the air and cry, whoa, who cares? Who cares? And a fatalist would be someone who would say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. Like, you know, God's plan is going to determine what happens to me. You know, no need to eat healthy and exercise. Why? If I'm going to have a heart attack or a stroke, it's going to come anyway. Right? If you get cancer, why bother with treatment? No, no, it's going to happen anyway. If, if, God, if that's what God wants for you, if you resist it and try to get well, well, now you're going against God. Or, you know, if God has already decided who's going to win the NHL playoffs, of course we know he made a mistake last year because the Jets weren't in the finals, but, you know, what kind of God is that? You know, this year? Like, how do we get here? How do we get into this place? Some are going to say, well, it's faulty theology. And I have to agree, because you see there, there was and is this belief that everything that happens is predetermined by God. So some will hold to the fact that there, there is nothing that happens without God being involved. Tornadoes, tsunamis, earthquakes, flash floods, sudden deaths, accidents, this is all somehow that God has predetermined. Now extreme camps of this theology would teach that God determines who will wind up in heaven, who will end up in hell, so it doesn't really matter how you live, or what you believe, the list is already predetermined even before you are born. So there's no free choice and there's nothing that you can do to actually alter the course of your life. And then there's another type of faulty theology which says that God created the universe with all of its life forms and then what he did is that he stepped back to watch what would happen. He is unengaged, he's detached, really doesn't care what happens. He's just curious to see what we will do. And, you know, he's totally uninvolved. He's certainly not loving. And each of these theologies can actually give some sort of proof text for their interpretation from the Scriptures. I even go so far as to say that maybe our Bible translations play a crucial part in it as well. The first authorized English translation of the Bible, if you did not know, was called the King James Version. And there's Romans 8.28, what we read before. It renders the verse this way. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And of course, we can read at that, and we can interpret that all things good and bad happen for a reason. For the good of them that loved God. Now, since the King James Version was the only English Bible for about 400 years, this understanding of God's work came to be authoritative. This is how we understood it. And so in this translation, God's role in all things that happen, both good and bad, is that God causes them. And then it's just really a short step from this verse to everything happens to a reason, for a reason. If you have an NIV Bible, it translates the verse this way. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And so what we find is that the difference is actually found in one tiny little proposition. Two tiny letters. In. There's a grand canyon of difference between all things working together and God working in all things. And so the NIV version says that no matter what happens, good or bad, explainable or unexplainable, God is at work in them. God is working through even the most tragic situations to what? To bring about good. The semantic difference is so, so small, but the theological difference is enormous. You know, after Alana died, her parents and I, we established a fund in her name to help kids in Indonesia to get an education who wouldn't have the chance otherwise 
to do so because of their poverty. It was just impossible for them. And so we used that money not only to pay for their tuition and food and housing and transportation, but they also had a small little uh, expense account. And, they could, and we realized that this whole thing uh, was a huge blessing to many students and still is to this day. Now, did God cause Alana to die so that the university could get that fund? Do you see how ridiculous that sounds? Or did God work through the tragedy of Alana's death and her parents' grief to create that fund as a way for her legacy to continue? And I think the problem with saying everything happens for a reason is that the word everything is all-encompassing. Covering everything from well-timed snow days to killer tornadoes, whatever you want to do. But what kind of God would open up a parking space for someone who's running late but wouldn't stop two planes from flying into buildings? You know, that's not the kind of God I want to worship so when we say this tagline, when we say this truism, when we say this cliche, in the face of a crisis or a very tragic situation, we're ascribing to God a casual role that paints him as a capricious, finicky deity who has the power to control everything, but chooses not to. So what do you do when you're faced with these kinds of situations? And I think you know what I'm talking about. You maybe have been diagnosed with a terminal disease. Maybe you suffered a death of a child or of a loved one, somebody very close to you. Maybe you were involved in an accident that wasn't your fault or you lost a job, you had a miscarriage or there was birth defects. You know, the, the list goes on and on and on. And sometimes... You know, we treat the Bible as if it's a series of sound bites and sayings that we, you know, we can put on t-shirts and coffee cups and posters, right? But when we find ourselves in the midst of grief, you and I as believers, when we find ourselves there or in a very tough time, what do we do? We go to the Scriptures, right? Because that's our go-to. That's what we're told to do. We go to the Scriptures for some sort of catchphrase assurance. We pick up our Bible and we read it. Well, according to your faith be it unto you, and, or we read, ask and it will be given to you, or seek and ye shall find, knock and the door will be opened to you. And so the Bible says that even if we pray and you believe, you will receive what you're asking for. Like even Jesus said, when you pray, pray to the Father in my name and anything you ask for in my name will be given to you. What do these phrases seem to be saying? Because in my mind, they sound like almost a guarantee. And Jesus said it, that's a promise, you know, I can claim it, and, and it's always going to come true. But there's a problem. Have you ever had an occasion when you had faith but didn't receive? Ever ask and it was never given? Ever seek and you never found? Ever knock and the door was never opened? Do you ever ask in the name of Jesus and it wasn't given? Have you ever had an occasion where you really thought you believed, but even though you believed, you didn't receive? So did you fail in your faith? Or did your faith fail you? Some people believe that one of these two reasons has to be true, but neither are true. See, there is an, another alternative, and it has nothing to do with you failing in the faith or your faith failing you. It could have everything to do with the Father knowing what is best. See, there's another brand of theology that is based upon the theme and principles that flow through the entire Bible. You know, one of those themes is that God gave us free will. And in the opening chapters of Genesis, God placed a tree of knowledge of good and evil there in the Garden of Eden. And he tells Adam and Eve, he says, don't eat of it or you will die. 
that you would basically separate themselves from God who was their source of life. And so they had a choice. God wanted them to choose life, but they chose to do their own thing and to separate themselves from God. And all of us have really made the same decision. And as a result of this separation from God, we, our world is a fallen world which has unleashed sickness and death and destruction. And in a fallen world, we're separated from God and, and even nature gets out of control. And so we can't blame God. Because over and over again, the Bible lifts up the theme that God is constantly whispering to us to choose life. I could have brought a whole bunch of different examples where it says choose life, but instead we always or seem to be prone to choose the things that destroy us. He's whispering to us, you know, don't drink and drive, don't get involved in an affair, don't look at porn, choose life. And we're free to listen to his voice or to ignore it. We can choose life or death. As I said earlier, our actions create consequences and our own choices produce results. So in a fallen world, we may also suffer the result of somebody else's choices. Persons killed by a drunk driver may have been choosing life, but they suffer the consequences of somebody around them who happens to choose death. In a fallen world, accidents happen. A flash flood happens. Sickness happens. Death happens. It's no one's choice. It just happens. It's not like God wanted it to happen. New, Pe New Testament professor at Asbury uh, Theological Seminary, his name is Dr. Ben Worthington. He had a daughter who died unexpectedly from a pulmonary embolism. And after his her death, he wrote these words. He said, From the day Christy died, I was determined to be open to whatever positive thing there might be to glean from this seemingly tragedy. I clung to the pro promise of Romans 8.28 that God works all things together for good for those who love him. The first point immediately confirmed in my heart was theological. God did not do this to my child. God is not the author of evil. God does not terminate sweet lives with a pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolisms are a result of the bent nature of this world as Anne, his wife kept repeating god is not the problem he's the solution see we live in a world where bad things happen but we are certain god didn't do them because of who we know god to be and it starts off with the premise that god is a good god otherwise all bets are off after that see if god is the off author of sin and evil and suffering, the fall, death, and the Bible makes no sense when it tells us that God tempts no one, that God's will is that none should perish, but all have everlasting life, and that death is the very enemy of God and humankind, and that Jesus himself, who is life, came to abolish and destroy it. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. If there are promises that I cling to, it's this one. Not the words that everything happens for a reason. God and his will are aligned with what is good and true and beautiful and loving and holy. And in a variety of ways, the scriptures tell us over and over again that God is love. As a matter of fact, if you remember nothing else today, just etch these words into your soul. God is love. That's the starting point. That's the reality that God is love. That, that, that is the trump card in our understanding of who God is. Love is the framework from which God operates. It would make no sense no sense for God to visit calamity upon his own children for whatever reason. Because he is love. If something isn't rooted in love, then we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it didn't come from God. God is love, period. God is always love. And when really awful things happen to us, it's just not helpful to hear the, the usual and often theologically un unsound cliches, you know, that good friends say with the very best of intentions. 
I have to say this. That faith requires that we live with at least some uncertainty. Not everything can be explained. Not everything is for a purpose. Not everything has something to teach us. Some events are just too awful for words. And no words are often more helpful in these situations. Listen to what the author writes in Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 32. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Which is interesting because my comment here is that sometimes God blesses those who trust him with some very spectacular results. We just see that. But also, faith enables us to accomplish things that are explainable only by God's power. Let's continue reading. Women receive back their dead, raised to life again. You know, this is the apex of spectacular, right? Like, wow, it doesn't get any more impressive than, than that. But without skipping the beat, the author continues. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might even gain even a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about it in sheepskin and goats skins and destitute and persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, living in the caves and in the holes in the ground. You know, sometimes God blesses those who trust him with the grace to endure horrible trials without wavering. Faith trusts God in spite of results. The author continues, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. And so really what the author's point here is that the Old Testament saints were faithful through all their trials, even though they didn't receive the promise of, of Christ in the flesh. The second half of that list were just as much people of faith as those in the first half. And as a matter of fact, you can argue that actually the second half of the list had a greater faith because it's not as easy to trust God when you are being scourged, when you are being so stoned, sawed in half, as it is when you're seeing foreign armies be put to flight or the dead being raised to life. See, while well, all of us, if we could, you know, we would probably want to sign up to the first group. You know, we need to recognize that sometimes God is pleased to withhold spectacular results and bless us instead with his grace as our sufficiency in, in, especially in overwhelming trials. And God will bless all who trust him with eternal rewards. And so, as people of faith, we, we must endure whatever trials come our way, even persecution, and we fix our eyes on Jesus. And you'll notice in Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and considered him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, the upside of faith is that many times we think, well, you know, if I have faith, God will bless me. And, and, and again, the, there's nothing wrong with that premise because it, it is true. There's a, this aspect of blessing to faith. But there's also a flip side of faith. And this is that, you know, God blesses our faith, but sometimes not in the way that we think, right? In the way that we think he should. And sometimes we end up going through sufferings and hard times. And that's obviously evident even by this passage that we just read. And so if God chooses 
not to get you out of a problem or he allows you to go through some sort of suffering. When you go through to the other side, according to the passage of Scripture, it's going to be worth it all, all along. Because why? We've clung to our faith, especially when nothing else makes sense. You know, God doesn't always do what we want, but whatever God does is the best. And there are times when God will not perform in a way that we think he should. In John chapter 11, we have the story of Lazarus. He's on his way to visit his sick friend. He gets delayed and Lazarus dies. When Jesus finally arrives, Mary and Martha are there and they tell him, look at Jesus, you're basically, you're too late. If you would have came sooner, you could have healed him. It would have been way better. But I'll, However, Lazarus has something better than a healing in store for him. He had a resurrection. And there are times when God doesn't do what we think he should do, but God always knows what he's doing. And he will use any situation in which we find ourselves for his best. The choice is up to us. He's the principle of the Father knows best. Either God knows what's best for us, or for you, or he doesn't. It's that simple. And so God is the perfect father, but he doesn't always do what we want him to do. And so real faith is not the ability to demand from God what you want and get it. It's the ability to receive from God what he gives you and to accept it, in spite of the circumstances in which you find yourself. So let me wrap up with some application. First, faith is ready to sacrifice present comfort for future reward with Christ. Faith recognizes that life is very short in comparison to eternity. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that faith recognizes that momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Paul, in, in, in Paul's case, when you think about it, this light affliction includes beatings, it includes imprisonments, being stoned, being shipwrecked, being in danger of death at all times. Just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Secondly, faith lives with a Godward focus and not a focus on people or things. You know, the saints that were mentioned in our text could endure mockings and scourgings, imprisonments and death. Because their focus was on God. It wasn't on people. It wasn't on things. They were looking to eternity, not to this vapor of life here on earth. Third, faith trusts and obeys God, leaving the result to His sovereignty. Some trust and obey God, and He grants some spectacular results. Others trust and obey the same mighty God and he enables them to endure horrific trials in his strength. And the difference is not in the people or in their faith, but in God's sovereign purpose for each situation. You know, we know the same God that these Old Testament saints knew. We and we even have more in, in, in that we know Jesus personally. And so we should trust in God as they did, regardless of the situation, but our trust, our hope is in that person of Jesus. And finally, faithfulness to Jesus counts more than anything else, even than life itself. I've been listening to old hymns done new. And uh, Martin Luther put it in a hymn called A Mighty Fortress. And again, I remember singing these lyrics over and over again. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Trusting God in whatever difficult situations we face. Because one day, one day soon we will hear, or maybe you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Life is hard. Stuff happens. And I know that that's not very pastoral of me to say, but it's true, isn't it? 
Something, sometimes things happen for no good reason and blaming God as a way of explaining it only makes matters worse. Instead, I think, let's choose to worship a God who works for good in all things. Even the things that we have screwed up. No matter what the circumstances you're in, God is with you. No matter how you got here or there, be it a failing body or a, uh, um, your own bonehead choices, right? God is with you. No matter the outcome will be, God is with you. And that's the role of grace in the midst of our tragedies. Life may never be the same, but life can still be good. And God is at work in that to help it make that so. So sanctuary, God is always there for us. Not teaching us lessons by causing things to happen, but loving us through things that do happen. And our hope is not dependent on finding some sort of reason to explain why bad things happen. Our hope is founded on the belief that God is with us. So whether there's a reason or no reason, God is with us in all things, always. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, you are God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and I know this to be true. You are the author of my days, my hours, my minutes, my seconds. You know the numbers of hairs even on my head. You are all-knowing. You are all-seeing. You are all-hearing, all-saving. You number the stars and you call them each by name. And yet, you invite me to bring my every care to you. And by your breath, you have called all things into existence. And it was your word that breathed life into my dead soul. And I know that you have done miraculous things in my life for your glory and for my specific good, but forgive me for allowing the memory of those works to fade. Forgive me for questioning your desire to do good after what I have seen and known of your goodness. Lord, I believe, but help help my unbelief. Forgive me for worshiping at the altar of fear instead of the altar of faith. So God, I pray that you'd remind me, remind us of our salvation. Remind us that though we fall short, we've been justified by your grace through Jesus Christ. And remind me that I have been born again into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So teach me, teach us that you are a God who is love. And teach me to believe that you are not slow to fulfill your promises. And what I see as slowness is actually your great patience towards me and others. God, teach me, teach us not to allow what we see to, God, what we see and experience to determine our faith. Teach me what it means to walk by faith instead of sight and dwell me with a spirit that is always dependent on and ever thankful for the cross and god teach me to pray to pray in submission to your good and perfect will and to trust that your answers can't be anything other than good and perfect in jesus name i pray amen soul sanctuary As you go from here into the coming week, may God open your mind to his presence so that you may truly come to know him. May he open the eyes of your heart so that you can experience the hope he offers to all who follow him. And may you come to understand the full extent of God's power at work in your life. The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God. And may the peace of God and the blessing of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you this week. Now go and live the church. See you next week.